Who are the dumbest criminals around? Let's find out. Starting with number five. Can't stop, won't stop. Kieran Hamilton, a young crypto bro, never expected his social media presence to lead to something that would change his life. Known as Kez online, he grew a following through his flashy posts showing off his newfound wealth earned through trading crypto. His Instagram feed was filled with images of luxury cars, designer clothes, and exotic vacations, painting a picture of a lifestyle that seemed too good to be true for someone from a modest background. But the reality of Kez's situation turned dark one night when he was woken up by strange noises in his home. He encountered two armed men demanding money, contraband, and watches. The intruders, wielding machetes, were aggressive and wouldn't listen to Kez, telling them he wasn't a dealer. In a matter of minutes, Kez found himself hurt and robbed, his belongings ransacked, and his French bulldog Rambo taken. The event left Kez physically injured and emotionally shaken. His online persona, once a source of pride and success, had become a liability attracting unwanted attention and putting him at risk of harm. Despite his claims of innocence and the absence of any evidence linking him to criminal activity, Kez had fallen victim to real world crime. What makes Kez's story particularly tragic is that he wasn't a typical target for such a robbery. He wasn't a high profile celebrity or a criminal. He was simply a man who had found a way to make money in a rapidly evolving digital landscape only to have his success overshadowed by the darker side of deciding to show off online. In the aftermath of the robbery, Kez's life was irrevocably changed. He no longer felt safe in his own home and was forced to reassess his relationship with social media, something most people should probably do anyway. What was once a platform for sharing his achievements had become a source of fear and anxiety. Despite the trauma he endured, Kez remained resilient. He has since shifted his focus away from crypto trading and towards investing in property seeking a more stable and secure source of income. While he acknowledges the role that social media played in his ordeal, he refuses to let it define him. Instead, he views his online presence as a means of documenting his journey and empowering others to pursue their dreams. Kez's story is a reminder of the dangers of living in an increasingly interconnected world. While social media offers countless opportunities for connection and self-expression, it seems like most of the time it just creates more problems than it solves. And like, hey, we can't fault the guy for wanting to show off when he first made some actual real money. Everyone who goes through it does something dumb with their money at least once. But the problem with flexing money online is that you never really know who's watching. And since it's the internet, if someone wants to find you, they're going to. Save some of the bragging. No one thinks it's cool anyway. Number four, Penny Pinching Got Pinched. Janie Renner, a UK-based QVC presenter known as Super Milf for her work selling slimming underwear on television, got in trouble cheating taxpayers out of more than £60,000 in a six-year VAT fraud. VAT is the UK's value-added tax program, which is basically sales tax. Renner, 53, was earning a hefty salary of over £80,000 annually as a QVC presenter. However, her financial mismanagement led to her downfall. The fraudulent activities began in 2009, when Renner failed to submit any tax returns to Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs, the HMRC, which is basically the UK's IRS. Despite her significant earnings, she neglected to pay VAT and income tax for her clothing business, which involved selling high-end scarves, sarongs, and fur hats at craft fairs and shows. Her failure to submit tax returns continued until 2015, when authorities discovered what she had been up to. The total amount of unpaid VAT amounted to roughly £50,000, with additional loss losses from unpaid income tax totaling around 61 pounds and a half thousand pounds. Renner's financial troubles were exasperated by a previous conviction for false accounting in 1995, for which she served a six-month prison sentence. This time, her actions cost her not only her job with the shopping channel, but also her reputation and financial stability. Renner's defense argued that her offenses occurred during a period of overwhelming debt, and she expressed remorse for her actions and actually sold her home in order order to repay her debts. However, her attempt to start fresh by marrying a Canadian and planning to move there was interrupted when she was arrested on a plane at Heathrow Airport. Despite facing serious charges, Renner was given a suspended 22-month prison sentence along with 300 hours of unpaid work. The judge cited her loss of job, business, and home as mitigating factors, opting to suspend the sentence. Despite her success as a QVC presenter, Renner's failure to pay her taxes led to legal trouble and tarnished her career. And the thing is, 
is, Renner could have avoided the whole thing by simply paying her taxes. Instead, she chose to take a risk, and it cost her dearly. The cost of prison is way higher than the cost of 60,000 pounds, that's for sure. Number three, that belongs in a museum. Billy Petherick, a British YouTube property renovator, and his French wife Gwendolyn found themselves embroiled in a criminal case in France after being convicted of stealing artifacts from the French churches. The couple, known for their popular YouTube channel, The Petherick's, chronicled their adventures renovating properties in France for their 360,000 subscribers. However, their escapades took a darker turn when they were found guilty of theft. Billy Petherick would enter churches and steal objects, such as chalices, ciboriums, patents, or tabernacle keys, which he would then sell in the UK via eBay or to a second-hand dealer. Their criminal activities reportedly spanned over 40 thefts committed in 2014. Despite their YouTube fame and successful renovation business, the couple turned to illegal means to supplement their income. The saga of Billy Petherick took a twist when it was revealed that he had deserted the Household Cavalry, a prestigious regiment that guards the Queen, a decade earlier. His desertion came to light when he appeared on Channel 4's Escape to the Chateau, DIY. The show inadvertently led to his identification by the military as his exact address at the Chateau de la Basmanie in Pays de la Loire was disclosed during the broadcast. Billy Petherick's journey from a military deserter to a YouTube sensation termed criminal highlights the complexities of his past. He deserted the army in 2009, fled to France, where he started a new life with Gwendolyn. Despite the picturesque setting of their renovated chateau and the success of their YouTube channel, Petherick's criminal activities caught up with them. The sentencing in France saw Billy Petherick receiving a one-year prison sentence and a 15,000 euro fine, while Gwendolyn was fined 10,000 euros. Additionally, their accomplice, a second-hand dealer, was fined 8,000 euros. We can't help but question the logic behind Billy Petherick's decision to engage in criminal activities despite having such a big YouTube channel. With a pretty good-sized following and presumably a comfortable income from their business, resorting to theft seems unnecessary and flat-out stupid. The draw of easy money and the desire for material wealth may have clouded his judgment, leading to the consequences for him and his wife. We can just hear Indy now. That belongs in a museum! Number two, please rob them. Two New York City men, Rambai Patel and Balwinder Singh, got in trouble after allegedly staging a string of bogus armed robberies to exploit immigration benefits. The duo's ploy involved orchestrating at least eight fake armed robberies, where a pretend robber would brandish what appeared to be a gun, snatch cash from store registers, then flee the scene. The entire act was captured by surveillance cameras strategically placed in the targeted stores. But their elaborate scheme had a strange twist. After the staged robberies, the store clerks were instructed to wait for five minutes or more before contacting the authorities to report the crime. This delay was supposedly aimed at creating the impression of a legitimate robbery scenario. The victims of these staged crimes, who were actually willing participants, paid Patel for his part in the charade. In return, Patel compensated the owners for allowing them to use their stores for the fake robberies. But why? The motive behind these fake robberies was to enable the store clerks to apply for a special immigration visa known as the U visa. This visa category is designed for immigrants who have suffered from crimes and have assisted law enforcement in prosecuting crimes. The U visa allows recipients to stay in the country for up to four years. Both Patel and Singh face charges of conspiracy to commit visa fraud. Singh, apprehended in Queens, appeared before a federal judge in Boston, while Patel, arrested in Seattle, awaited trial in detention. If convicted, the duo could each face a maximum sentence of five years in prison and a hefty fine of up to two $150,000. The absurdity of the situation doesn't escape notice, and you can't help but wonder why Patel and Singh went to such lengths when, given a bit more time, an actual robbery might have occurred naturally, especially in a city like New York. Perhaps they could have saved themselves the trouble and waited for a genuine opportunity to present itself rather than concocting such a convoluted plan. Ultimately, the whole scam seems like it was a lot more trouble than it was worth, but really shows the length some are willing to go to to exploit loopholes in the system. As the saying goes, truth can indeed be stranger than fiction, and this bizarre case of staged robberies for immigration perks is a testament to that. If you're enjoying this video, be sure to stay tuned right here for our past release to find out how this dumb jewelry thief got caught stealing because of her TikToks. Number one, hot Ferrari. 
Cody Detweiler is a popular YouTube personality with roughly 7 million subscribers who goes by Whistling Diesel. He burned down his brand new Ferrari F8 valued at around $400,000 when it suddenly burst into flames along with a rental minivan. Both vehicles were reduced to a pile of ash. The whole thing, which went down in Waco, Texas, was captured on video and shared on his channel. In the video, Detweiler proudly displayed his new Ferrari performing stunts in an empty cornfield surrounded by dry grass. However, the excitement quickly turned to panic as his right tire caught fire, prompting his friends in the rental van to urgently warn him of the blaze. Despite their efforts to extinguish the flames, fire rapidly spread, engulfing both vehicles within minutes. As the situation escalated, one of Detweiler's friends made a frantic call to emergency services, requesting immediate assistance to contain the growing inferno. Despite their best efforts to douse the flames, the fire proved undousable, leaving behind nothing but charred remains of the once luxurious car and van. He wasn't even sure if he actually had insurance on the car. Maybe he said that just as a joke, because taking a $400,000 loss in this way is pretty bad planning. Amidst the aftermath, speculation arose among fans with some questioning whether the entire ordeal was staged for views. However, Detweiler denied any involvement in causing the fire, pointing out the loss of personal belongings and sentimental items, such as evidence of the incident's authenticity. With a net worth of approximately $5 million, he assured his audience that replacing the destroyed Ferrari would pose little financial strain. So thank heavens for that. We wouldn't want this guy to not be able to get another Ferrari, you know? Some things would just be too sad. The video quickly went viral, grabbing over 5 million views within days of its upload, further solidifying Detweiler's status as a YouTube sensation. Despite the supposed devastation of losing his prized sports car, Detweiler maintained the lighthearted tone throughout the ordeal, emphasizing the importance of enjoying life's adventures before unforeseen problems occur. Detweiler acknowledged the likely repercussions on his insurance premiums, jokingly remarked on the sudden spike in rates following the fiery incident. His casual attitude about the whole thing with friends had his viewers questioning the authenticity of the video. If you're asking us, well, he's in this video. That's enough said. We're definitely curious to hear what the insurance adjuster said, even if he were insured. Crimes are always more fun when the criminals aren't the brightest bulbs in the pack. Let's buckle up for this one and start with... Number six, don't mind if I do. Mary Ellis Valencia Martinex stole about $32,000 worth of jewels from a man she visited in Miami. Martinez flew to meet the man after they had spoken online for about two months. Martinez first noticed the man's jewels when he put two diamond rings and a diamond bracelet in a clear plastic bag as they were parking his car. Apparently, there was a sign suggesting that people shouldn't leave their valuables in their car, so, of course, he couldn't be leaving diamond rings and diamond bracelets, you know? Especially if he wasn't planning on wearing them. And it's not like he could just leave them at home or something. Doesn't everyone just drive around with thousands of dollars in jewelry they're not wearing? Anyway, during the date, Martinez asked the guy if she could wear the jewelry and wanted to know how much it was worth and how much it would sell for, because questions like that aren't suspicious at all. The guy didn't tell her any details concerning the price, but allowed her to wear the jewelry anyway. The two of them went to a nightclub and returned home where Martinez gave it all back. The guy took the rings and the bracelet and placed them in a box on the shelf in his room. Early the next morning, Martinez woke the guy up and asked him to take her back to the airport, which he did. Before leaving the hotel, he saw the box on the shelf and assumed the jewels were still in it. Unbeknownst to him, Martinez had done a little creative housekeeping, and by creative housekeeping we mean she stole the jewels. A few days later, the guy saw her using the jewels to record videos on TikTok. It must have took him a few days to notice his diamonds were stolen. He texted her through WhatsApp and asked her to send them back. Martinez refused and told him that she would send them back whenever she returned to Miami. Her excuse was that it was too expensive to send them back. Which is a pretty good excuse if you're five years old. However, Martinez didn't return to Miami at the time she promised she would. But when she did return, she was arrested. The guy reported her to authorities, so they had been on the lookout. Once she flew into Fort Lauderdale, her goose was cooked. 
Unfortunately, we don't know if this arrest will result in the victim getting his jewelry back. Maybe don't bring expensive jewelry you're not wearing on your next date, huh? Number five, double check the insurance. Uloma Curry Walker hired teenagers to bump off her husband because she wanted to benefit from his life insurance. She was married to Fire Department Lieutenant William Walker for just four months. It must have been bliss since she was already planning to end the marriage by becoming a widow and inheriting everything he had. Uloma was thousands of dollars in debt and was nearing financial ruin. William didn't know about this debt and he also didn't know that Uloma wasn't actually suffering from the stage four breast cancer she'd claimed to have, but he was figuring it out. So what did our enterprising future widow-in-chief do to get her husband bumped off? She did what any reasonable person would have done. She spoke to her 17-year-old daughter. Her daughter then told her 20-year-old boyfriend, Chad Paget about it. Paget told Yoloma that he could get the job done, but he needed some payment. She decided to pay him $1,000 up front and said she would pay him the rest after the job was completed. However, the 20-year-old Paget surprisingly wasn't exactly accomplished at what he was hired to do, so he decided to farm the job out to another guy named Chris Hine. Hine initially accepted the job, but then brought in yet another co-conspirator, Ryan Doherty. This co-conspirator seemed to be the most willing to do the job, and he only asked for a meager fee of $800. The reason Yoloma hired the boys to do the job was because she thought nobody would think she did it. Because who in their right mind would think she'd hire a bunch of actual kids to go after her husband? In any case, the deed was eventually done. Doherty fatally ambushed William as he went out to get his fake cancer-having white fast food. Yoloma, who must have a huge hole in the place where her conscience lives, rode with William in the ambulance as he was transported to the hospital. Yoloma's big plan was to get William's life insurance benefits, but had overlooked a tiny detail. She wasn't the beneficiary of the life insurance. Instead, William's ex-wife was the beneficiary. For some reason, William hadn't gotten around to changing the name on the benefits from his ex-wife to his new wife, probably because he wasn't expecting his new wife to plan his demise. Not only did Yoloma not get the the life insurance money, but she also got arrested by the police. The police offered plea deals to Yoloma's co-conspirators, and they took it, even if her daughter testified against her at trial. In return for the plea deals, Hine, Paget, and Doherty all got reduced life sentences. Yoloma, on the other hand, was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. But she's single, right? What a catch. Number four, caught on camera. Haley Barlow reported to her insurance company that her car had been stolen. But what she left out of the report was that she was the one who towed it away and then set it on fire. Barlow told the police that she'd woken up one morning and discovered that her car keys had been stolen and her car was nowhere to be found. She then went on to make a $2,000 claim for the apparent theft. But things quickly turned into a junkyard fire for Barlow. The police found the car and discovered that it had been set alight. Then they found out that the burnt car didn't have an engine. They returned to Barlow, who insisted that the car was in its proper working condition before it was stolen. Honestly, promise, promise. Unfortunately for her, that claim wasn't enough to keep those pesky coppers from snooping around, sticking their noses in everyone's business. The police eventually found CCTV footage that showed the car being towed by a tow truck with Barlow sitting right inside it. This was all the evidence needed to prove that our little victim was actually an arsonist fraudster. Further investigations revealed that Barlow had paid the driver of the tow truck about 20 pounds. After the car was towed to another location, she then used a can of butane gas to set the vehicle on fire. Barlow was eventually arrested and charged. She pleaded guilty to fraud and claimed that she had carried out the scam because of debts and the amount of money and repairs the car was costing her. Therefore, she saw setting the car on fire and getting insurance funds for it as her only option. Police said that the actions of people like Barlow weren't only criminal, but also constituted a, a wildfire risk. The fire from her vehicle had caught the dry undergrowth on the road and the fire had spread a considerable distance away from the car. Thankfully, it went out before it had the chance to spread to the farms and fields nearby. You were driving a VW, Haley. You probably could have just waited a few more days and it would have caught fire on its own. Number three, not seeing the problem. A supposedly blind Italian man scammed the government of thousands of euros in benefits before he was caught window shopping and driving. Our lovable fake blind man got about 144,000 euros over 13 years from the Italian government with a fake sob story. He claimed that he became blind in 2008 due to a congenital problem. Unfortunately for our blind guy, and perhaps fortunately for the Italian government, he just couldn't keep this lie going for long. Ten years after he declared blindness, he decided to apply for a driver's license. 
This alerted the police, who decided to check in on him. They don't typically like blind people driving because it's dangerous or whatever. So either he'd suddenly gotten cured of his blindness because the thoughts and prayers finally worked, or he was just a careless liar. As it turned out, he was just a careless liar, even though our money was on the thoughts and prayers working. The police staked out his apartment and saw him riding a scooter. They also saw him doing things that blind people generally find time to do, such as driving a car, looking at your phone while driving, looking at shop windows, and teaching a child how to ride a bike. Incidentally, the blind man wasn't unknown to the police. He had only recently received a jail sentence of nearly 15 years for being part of a group that staged fake traffic accidents for insurance payouts, which again, is the sort of thing you would expect the blind man to do. Lastly, the police discovered that the man was already financially stable as he owned a garage. Despite that, he still collected a basic income that the authorities only give its poorest citizens. We can't really hate on a guy pretending to be blind. We pretend to be deaf all the time. Please stop playing with the dinosaur bones. This is a museum. What? Bef Number two, double dipping. Marina Golfo tricked her bosses at the City Department of Education into giving her three months of sick leave while she served time in prison for defrauding taxpayers and students. While she was in prison, Marina was paid over $24,000 by the Department of Education. Her journey to conviction and imprisonment began when she defrauded taxpayers of over $150,000 through a program that served developmentally challenged children. For three years, Marina submitted forged treatment notes and invoices to the program claiming payment for over 1,500 therapy sessions she never actually provided. But the program eventually found out what Marina was doing, and she was arrested and sentenced to three months in prison. She was also asked to pay restitution for all the money she'd collected from the program. But our scammer wasn't about to go gently into that good night. She had one more trick up her sleeve. Once in prison, Marina sent a letter to the Department of Education asking for paid sick leave. She included a doctor's note in her request claiming that she was too sick to come to work and and should remain at home. After that, she submitted requests to prison and court officials asking for a compassionate release before her time in prison was served. Her reason was the COVID-19 pandemic and her elderly parents needed a caretaker. The court refused and said her arguments didn't hold up. At the same time, Marina's requested time for sick paid leave was coming to an end. So she did the smart thing and requested more sick leave. And the department approved the request. They had no idea that Marina was a jailbird and not a sick bird. And it gets even better. The Department of Education initially knew of Marina's arrest. The arrest was widely reported, and she had even been reassigned from her primary position in the department in anticipation of her sentencing. When Marina was eventually sentenced, she simply informed no one, and no one bothered to check. The Human Resources Division of the department had no idea that Marina was requesting sick leave from jail, so they granted it. But this gig couldn't go on for long. After Marina served her time in prison, someone who wasn't minding their own business informed the department about her stint in prison and she was eventually fired. According to Marina, she had done absolutely nothing wrong. She claimed that while in prison, she suffered complications from shingles, so she would have been unable to go to work even if she hadn't been in prison. So her request for sick leave was valid since she wouldn't have been able to go to work anyway. What a coincidence! However, it doesn't seem like Marina will get away with her scam as the Department of Education has requested a refund of all the monies it paid out. She has also been banned from doing any any further work for the department. Looks like Marina taught her last lesson. Just because you're accurate doesn't mean you're right. Number one, Grandma and the BBL. Tiffany Acuna stands accused of using the credit card of an Alzheimer's patient to pay for her cosmetic surgery. When the theft occurred, Tiffany worked as a certified nursing assistant and was tending to an 88-year-old. The fraud itself was simple. Tiffany merely took the credit card information of her patient and used it to purchase a Brazilian butt lift, J-plasma, and arm lipo procedures. The husband of the victim in this case contacted the fraud department of his bank when he received a bill for over $7,000 in his wife's name. The department told him that the bill was for cosmetic surgery. He didn't believe his 88-year-old wife would be getting a Brazilian butt lift, so he immediately knew something was wrong, and he probably was also a little disappointed. The victim's husband then contacted the agency that Tiffany worked for, and she was immediately fired. But that was only the first of her headaches. Tiffany contacted the victim 
Jacob's husband to set up a repayment plan. She wanted to sign a loan agreement that would mandate her to pay $1,000 monthly. She might have done this because she was in nursing school and wanted to avoid criminal charges. Unfortunately for her, the police weren't having any of that. They went to the victim's house and waited for Tiffany to show up. When the nursing scammer arrived with $1,500 in cash and a loan repayment agreement, she was ambushed by the police who took her into custody. With all those cosmetic surgeries, there's probably a couple online careers you'll be able to fall back on, Tiffany. Click to watch one of these next videos. Let us know in the comments section what you would rather have. Free in and out for life or free Shake Shack for life.